Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Horse Geeks podcast, where we look at horses and riding from the inside out. I'm Kirsten Nelson, professional horse trainer. And with me once again is my good friend, Deb Romero, certified Alexander Technique instructor. So since we're getting a little close to Halloween, we thought we'd do a podcast on tricks and treats. I'm not sure which way we're going to go. I don't know where we're going to go with it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> we're going to talk about tricks and then we're going to talk about treats it's separately. Like, oh, it's like, eh, tricks Let's or treats. It. Let's see where we land. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's funny because the most watched video on the YouTube channel. So the YouTube channel that hosts the podcast, I also do Horse Geeks Hacks, where I just sort of, you know, do short videos on the 10 million things that we need to know about horses, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the most popular videos by a long shot that got the most views was the hack I did on giving treats. So I thought it would be a good podcast topic because obviously there's a lot of questions out there about using treats, which we've talked about before, positive and negative reinforcement. And treats are just a form of positive reinforcement. Treats can also be used as a distraction tool to sort of mix up the horse's brain when you have to get something done that the horse doesn't typically like. And I just posted, or I will be posting shortly, some videos on trailer loading where you're using entirely using treats and positive reinforcement to get the horse to load themselves in the trailer. That's a very powerful way to use treats. Yeah, and we talked about my horse who, that doesn't work. (laughs) Treats don't work. Right, because with trailer loading, if there's a fear issue, treats won't work. Yeah. Right? So let's kind of start with treats and just Okay. go from there. Do you use treats? Because this becomes, oh, this is like a burning oh, this is topic really, at some I barns. hope we get some <laughs> challenging comments about this one. Yeah, because people are sort of like all or nothing about treats. I right. never give treats. I never hand feed my horse. Treats are bad. Never give, you know, put them it's in the bucket, but never hand feed them. Treats you know, make horses aggressive. It's interesting because like you mentioned at the beginning, it's kind of a distraction. Um, So I use treats with two of my horses, but not the third one. Why is that? Because Plumley, my little halflinger, he gets, he gets, I can see why people say no treats because otherwise he's constantly mouthing you. He gets neurotic about it. He's neurotic. That's a good way to put it. Yes, I've seen that a lot. So I just go, no treats. So when they get neurotic like that, first, let's talk about why that happens. Because treats, well, any positive reinforcement, which means treats, clickers, food, even affection, is reinforcing the thought in the horse's mind. So if we're not paying attention to the energy, the expression, the body language of the horse, the way horses become neurotic about treats is because they're given while the horse is in the fight flight nervous system. Mm. So it's reinforcing anxiety or tension, right? So if the horse is pinning their ears or they're highly anxious, Some people are giving treats the same way I eat Ben and Jerry's when I'm stressed out (laughs) is they're using food to sort of quell the energy, right? Right. And I go, it might work with my Ben and Jerry's and a stressful day, but it doesn't really work for horses because when you're giving treats and the horse is exhibiting anxiety or tension, you're reinforcing anxiety and tension. That energy level. Yeah. Yeah. You're giving positive reinforcement to the wrong state of mind. Yeah. And that's sort of, if I were a real purist about treats, I would give treats. It's an exclamation point or a positive reinforcement, or I like to call it the paycheck for, Uh, for nice thoughts, for cooperation, mm. for calm energy, for something I want to reinforce. 
So that's sort of the purest perspective. So a lot of times, you know, friends, kids, husbands come into the barn and they just want to give treats to horses. Like, yes, that's uh, their whole point of purpose yep. of being there. So they're just walking down a barn aisle, randomly giving treats out to horses, not recognizing what are the thoughts, what's the emotional state of the horses while they're getting the treat. And right. so that's exactly how horses become neurotic about treats or aggressive about treats um, or anxious when you give a treat. Yeah, my other two don't. Um, I Finer Things has a problem with being girthed up. So I use a treat and my treats are just carrot pieces. So, cause I've got, metabolic issues with horses here so yeah. I don't I don't feed any and maybe that's another reason people don't want to give treats I get it I mean I don't want somebody coming into my barn with some bag treats full of molasses and sugar right to my insulin resistant horse. right <laughs> so. and for any non-horse people husbands friends of horse people or wives I should say to um Walking through the barn and giving other people's horses treats is a big faux pas. It's a no-no. I would think so. Because you don't know if that horse has metabolic issues. Right. And that little chunk of sugar could send that horse into a laminitic episode. Yeah. Or do damage to that horse. So we don't always know. And right. I found sugar-free treats, peppermint flavored sugar-free treats, and they're sugar-free peppermints and carrots, apples, of course, healthy treats. But um, I love giving treats. I use them a lot. And with your two mares, what you're saying is you can give a treat as a positive reinforcement and they're happy to get it, but don't get anxious or tense when you give them. Exactly. The it's a, so that's why you use treats with them. But and like I said, on the other hand, Plumley, my little halflinger is just neurotic. Yeah. So um, Rafalco, the horse I took when he showed up as an ex-show horse, he was the same way. Absolutely neurotic about treats. And to the point he would paw, even if I was oh. walking in front of him and he would start shaking his head and pawing, like demanding the treats while he's wow overarching his neck, gnashing his teeth, the full neurosis, right? So that's an example. If I want to correct that, which I did with him, and I want him to enjoy treats in a healthier mental state, then what I did was I flooded him with treats, which is, <laughs> <clears throat> it sounds like a weird strategy. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but it works very well. So I picked a healthy treat, like I literally cut up carrots, a whole bag of carrots into like little slices. So I had lots to give him, mm -hmm. but it was healthy. And when I would tack him up or put him in the cross ties, he would instantly start that neurosis in anticipation of a treat. Wow. And so what I would do is I'd stand there for a few minutes and I would just stuff his face with treats. <laughs> Like I just over treated him and just kept stuffing his face and stuffing his face until he could calm that energy down just a little. <clears throat> and it sounds backwards. Like it sounds completely backwards to feed the neurosis until they calm down. But it was the only way I found for them to overcome that trigger reaction to the treat mm -hmm. is I overdid it. That makes sense. And so for a while, I would have like a whole bucket of carrot slices. And while I was tacking him up, I just kept stuffing his face with treats. Right. And it worked it. And I've done that several times with horses that um, that have the reaction you're describing with Plumley is I suddenly give them more than what they expected. And as you feed, because the neurosis is sort of the anticipation of it being taken away. 
Right. Like they get one, but the anxiety, it was given while they were anxious. And then they're looking for the next one and the next one and the next one. So the more I stuffed his face with carrot slices, he actually started to satiate and that energy level changed. And that eventually got him completely back to normal with treat giving. So hmm. sometimes he does the sort of token toe paw, but it, it's like a little reminiscent shadow of what he used to do in his full blown neurosis with treats. Yeah. And that's counterintuitive to what we think we should do, which is like you do zero treats, take yeah. away the neurosis, don't even offer treats. So or I, I put it in the feed bucket and he's stay, he's stalled next to a border horse. And when they come on the weekends, I can always tell on Monday he's back into his neurotic state because they've been giving him treats ah, over yeah. the weekend. <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. So try that and okay. we'll check back in, in the podcast to see how that goes, but pick a nice, <laughs> healthy treat. You know, you could do a sugar-free something because I know he is prone to laminitis. Yeah. And he's so, my metabolic boy. Yeah. So I would find something there's sugar-free peppermints or um, sugar-free little like disc size treats or shaped treats that I found at the feed store or, you know, carrots aren't too high in sugar. So even um, hay pellets or hay yeah. cubes fed by hand can be kind of a treat. So you could try that and let me know how it goes. Okay. It, it worked for Rafalco very well. And the other sort of backwards way of using treats that I found, because like I said, theoretically ideal, you give the treat while the horse is in a calm, attentive, cooperative, friendly state that reinforces the right frame of mind. But plying my horse with treats while he was neurotic helped him overcome that habit. And then I also have used treats for horses that turn around and try to bite you when you're girthing up or saddling. Oh. Or for giving, make, getting them better to take the bridle or trailer loading. Or I had one humongous horse who was really dangerous when it came to giving a needle. He was uh. off the charts dangerous with um, getting shots. Mm. And what I did with him was, again, I bought two bags of carrots. I filled up a little feed bucket with carrot slices. <laughs> <clears throat> and when the vet would come, because he really got to the point, it was dangerous and he could tighten his neck so hard. He was bending needles and pushing them oh out my gosh. during the injection. It was pretty bad. So I would stand at his head. And while the vet was taking her time, getting close, getting into needle position, I was at the, at the head, getting his attention on me and literally stuffing treats into his mouth as fast as he could chew them. <laughs> and what that does, whether it's being needle shy or with a farrier, that's another time I used it with a horse was the, you know, fear of the farrier. When you're mixing up a treat with something that frightens them, again, you have to overload them with treats. One or two won't do the trick. You have to literally keep their mouth moving the whole time. Um, but it puts something they like with something they don't like. Right. Right. And if they're truly in a high level of fear, they won't even take the treats. So that's yeah. when you know you need more preparation simulation work. But if it's just a matter of high anxiety or tension during the shoeing, during the vet visit, you can mix up the thing they love, the treat, during the process of the thing that they're not too sure about, the needle, the, the farrier, and it confuses the mind. Ah. And so the more I can confuse the horse between something they want with something they don't want, they start to accept the thing that they don't like. They start to focus more on the thing that they want and less on the thing that they don't want. But I have to keep their attention on me 
And we're talking a bucket of treats, not one or two, like a constant shove in the mouth, treat after treat after treat after treat as a distraction from the thing that is bothering them. And again, that sounds counterintuitive to the theoretical ideal, but we can use treats strategically to either overwhelm that neurotic desire for the next treat or distract horses from something that bothers them with something that they like. Yeah, and when you're my big mare that doesn't like to load in the trailer and the fear comes up and the treats don't work, what works for her as a treat is positive reinforcement. In what way? What kind of positive reinforcement? Touching her. Touching her. When she takes a step forward, just petting her, and she's like, oh, okay. And you can see her whole body just go, oh, okay, that was the right thing to do. You know, exactly. She lets go and and she'll keep taking those mini steps. Yeah. So like the number one tool of positive reinforcement that we always carry with us is pausing. Just taking the pressure off the horse. Number one, positive reinforcement. Number two that we always carry with us is affection. Giving the horse affection, like you're saying, just petting them, reassuring them, that that also can act as positive reinforcement. And thirdly, treats. And then some people use a clicker. Clicker training is basically just a click as a positive reinforcement. That's what that is. So affection, food, or a a sound, or just doing nothing, taking the pressure off the horse is positive reinforcement. That's huge for my big mare is distance, you know, the energy that you're bringing to the situation. That to her means boatloads. Yeah. And And it does to more horses and people just don't realize it. Well, and the other positive reinforcement when a horse is in fear, giving the nervous system time to adapt Mm -hmm. and relax. That's why pausing, backing off a little bit, not pushing so much, taking more time to do a task when there's fear involved for the horse. That's why it's positive reinforcement. You're giving that nervous system time to adapt until the horse internally has a sense of feeling safe. Yes. And there's no greater reward to a horse than feeling safe. Yeah. Right. Treats are kind of a poor substitute for that. And that's why they don't work. If the horse is authentically fearful, (coughs) they couldn't give, I was going to use not G-rated language, but they couldn't, (laughs) they couldn't care less about having food at that moment because, pause. (laughs) yeah, they're, they're worried about their safety. Yes. And I've noticed, um, because Plumley is just coming off of a laminitic episode and just changing the routine at the barn. Mm Mm-hmm. <clears throat> really has an influence on the energy level of the barn of the horses. Interesting. Yeah. And how so? Um, I had to move Plumley to a dry lot, which he's away from his herd. Mm-hmm. And that took about three or four days. For him to for, settle into. For everybody to calm down and, and be okay with the situation. So yeah. I'd, I don't know if treats would be helpful with something like that. It can be like a horse that's hard to catch. Uh I still have to work on the catching, but carrying a treat or two with me can sort of be the difference. Once they overcome the fear of me approaching them and putting the halter on, when I approach, if I also have a treat with me, that can just sort of be the icing on the cake. Uh, You know, a little bit more reason to put some effort into being caught, right? Or in your situation, maybe the putting out, 
you give a treat when you put them out. Maybe when you go catch them, you give a treat when you catch them. Like it just, you really have to think in categories with treats. Am I using it sort of as pure positive reinforcement for not only the horse doing what I wanted spontaneously, but also in a calm, cooperative, attentive energy? Or am I using treats to um, distract the horse from something they don't like mm. and mix up the mind? Or am I using treats to, um, I don't want to say, I guess the overcoming the neurosis about treats is in a different category because that itself, the treat giving itself became a problem. So I really want to think, am I giving a treat to as positive reinforcement? Am I giving a treat, which is the exclamation point on already getting what we wanted? Or am I using the treat sort of to mix up the brain and provide something good with something challenging? Those would be kind of the two main categories for using treats. Yeah. And so things like you know, vet visits. It's part of domestic life for a horse, same with the farrier. And not all horses feel safe and comfortable with the vet because there's things that the vet has to do that aren't comfortable, yeah. right? Same with the farrier. And so that's a great place to use treats to mix up the brain and sort of make, just like, you know, the kids, the pediatrician has lollipops at the doctor's office. You know, it's like, or the, it's like getting that little treat with something that was kind of unpleasant and uncomfortable, but necessary. Right. Right. The Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the treat neurosis. <laughs> okay. So, so if the horse is bad with needles or if the horse, like even some horses are really bad taking an oral syringe, deworming or giving medication through an oral syringe. So you can fill the oral syringe with some kind of treat like molasses water or, That's um, a good point. you know, peppermint oil water, something like that and syringe a treat into them to sort of go, hey, not all syringing tastes terrible like a dewormer. You might like it. Right? Or horses that don't want to take the bit, I'll put a treat on the other side of the bit. So as I'm lifting the bridle up and asking the horse to take the bit, they have to take the bit to get the treat on the other side of the bit. Oh. And that really can develop a positive acceptance of taking the bit <clears throat> when you're bridling a horse. For baby horses, I actually use treats a lot to teach them how to take the bit and release the bit because the chewing action actually helps them learn how to open the mouth softly and how to push the bit out of their mouth with their tongue rather than letting it clank the teeth. Clank and then and they hit their teeth. Ugh. Right. And then they learn lockjaw. So a bit, or sorry, a treat can work very well to sort of get the horse's mouth chewing so that they learn how to softly take the bit in the mouth or how to sort of push the bit out of their mouth with their tongue. So a treat going in and a treat before I take the bit off, I do a lot with um, young horses or horses that are bad to bridle. Yeah. That and again, sense. it's it starts if they don't like the bit or don't like taking the bridle, <clears throat> It's working on a little bit of that something good coupled with something they don't like part of right. using treats too. And then the trailer loading video I did, if I'm trailer loading a horse for life, which means I have to build acceptance, safe, a sense of safety, a sense of acceptance, a real willingness for horses to put themselves in the trailer, mm. that's where I use treats. So if they're, if they're in fear, you can't use that method of trailer loading. You have to overcome the fear first, which means a lot of times standing around the trailer, yes. <laughs> just letting them gradually calm the nervous system 
while they're in the context of thinking about loading or staying in or unloading. But once the fear level has gone way down, the treats act as a motivator, kind of gives them a reason to put themselves in the trailer. And so if I don't have to use a whip <clears throat> and I don't have to put any pressure on the halter or lead rope, but I can offer a treat and the horse starts to load themselves in the trailer, then I know I have a horse that is really learning to accept the job of trailering and really reducing fear, increasing acceptance. So I like to use that method if I'm really trying to get a horse to trailer load easily for the rest of their life. Yeah, and I think we, what we talked about last time is we need to keep that in our routine as part of their job. Getting Until in they're good at it. Yeah. <clears throat> Once they're good at it, they're good at it. Horses have exceptional memories. And so the training part of it is taking the time needed to first get through the fear barrier, which is a waiting game and patient repetition. Then the second layer is for the horse, can you learn to put yourself in the trailer in order to get food or treats mm -hmm. as a motivator? And once they achieve that second phase of trailer loading training, I can not load them for years, take them to a trailer, ah. and they'll still get in easily. It'll take maybe five minutes as opposed to an hour. Yeah. Right? <laughs> We've been there, done that. Yeah. And I've tested that theory over and over and over. And it's like, my horses don't trailer very often anymore. But right. anytime I need them to get in, if I had reached that training um, goal where they were loading, waiting, and unloading strictly for the food motivation, then I don't have to keep working on it. Uh. I'm done. And so that's why I do it that way, because once they decide to get in or wait or are calm getting out, motivated by food, then that horse is so comfortable with the trailer, you've gained acceptance for the trailer. So I don't have to keep repeating it. Good to know. So anything else about treats you want to... <clears throat> Because it's a big topic. Like I, so many people are, I give treats randomly for no reason at all. Other people are like, I never give treats. And I go, there's middle ground in there. Yeah. It depends. It depends. I think that's what I have heard from all of my good mentors is if I ask a question and they always say, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, yes. No, and sort of like trailer loading, I had a young horse come in that was a really would not take the bridle. Horrible. Even with treats, I could hardly get him to take the bridle. It would take 30 minutes to get the bridle on wow. with a boatload of treats. Turns out the horse had neck pain. So I go, no wonder he didn't want the bridle. Yeah, right? it depends. No wonder. So just like trailer loading, if there's a fear issue and things like bad to bridle or girthiness and that kind of thing, it can be a pain issue. Yeah, can. <clears throat> and if the treats aren't working, that actually tells me look a little deeper, just like right. trailer loading. Oh, and that was the other thing I wanted to bring up with treats was a lot of times horses that are cold backed or they get back sore or they don't like being girthed. <clears throat> Even if we're girthing politely or cinching politely, which means putting the girth or the cinch on just tight enough that the saddle won't move while we're tacking up, but not so tight that we need for riding. If we're polite about how we tighten the girth or the cinch slowly, some horses still will sort of swing their head around to bite you while you're girthing. And that's a big problem across the board. So again, this is counterintuitive, but very successfully, I've worked with many horses that did that. 
And even if they're in cross ties, they can figure mm -hmm. out how to get their head and neck around in order to bite you while you're girthing up. And so knowing that the horse was going to do that, I would have treats ready. And as soon as they turned around to bite me, I would stuff a treat in their mouth uh. and it would shock them. Right. It would just sort of surprise them. It's the mixing up something they don't like with something they like. And instead of smacking them, which only leads to more sort of it only makes them desire to bite you more. <laughs> yeah, negative supporting negative doesn't turn to positive. <laughs> right, punishment just doesn't work. And we're usually, our timing is slow and we're late. So I found it very effective that if the horse has the habit to sort of swing that neck around and try to bite me while I'm girthing up, that I just stuff a shove a treat in their face as soon as they turn around because <laughs> the mouth is open anyways. <laughs> And I went, it's kind of, it's a way to, I would joke about it to make light because people get very upset about that and it can be dangerous. So I go, how can we turn that frown upside down? Yeah. How can go. we make girthing a positive experience or at least one that the horse could tolerate? Right. Right. And so when they whip their head around, they get a treat. And then eventually I was able to work my way to give the treat pull up the girth and they never swung their head around. Ah. Right. Yeah, that's that's what finer things used to do. And now she turns her head around and is happy because she knows she's going to get a treat. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes it turns from biting into uh -huh. like prick tears and can I have a treat? Can I have a treat of the instead neck? of I'm going to bite you? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or like with the farrier, I had a huge draft horse that was terrified of the farrier. Not easy. And for her, every time uh, we, we had to do many sessions with the actual farrier there. And I started with the sort of flooding of treats, just so many treats that she finally could not take another peppermint. She actually, ref you know, she was taking all these treats and then finally, she's like, I'm stooped. I can't take any more. <laughs> I go, that's treat saturation when they can't take any more treats. But every time the farrier would pick up her foot, I would start shoving treats in her mouth. And then when the farrier would put the foot down, I would start crinkling paper and taking my time unwrapping the peppermints and build the anticipation but she only would get the treats when the farrier was underneath picking up her feet. And that again was very effective, but I ended up giving her a cavity. <laughs> so I should have used carrots instead of peppermints. <laughs> but you know, those huge bins of those individually wrapped soft peppermints, that's yes. what I used. Because I, I needed a high incentive for her level of fear <laughs> dealing with the farrier. And I go, so be careful not to give your horse a cavity. But That's funny. <laughs> but those are the different ways I've used treats um, to help horses overcome these challenges that are just part of domestic life or positive reinforcement. So now it's like all of my horses ground tie while I'm tacking up. I just sort of drop the lead rope and they get one treat if they stand there and don't walk off. <laughs> then when I pull the halter and the fly mask off to put the bridle on, they get another treat if they don't walk off. And then they get a third treat underneath the bit while they're taking the bit. And it's like that little program of three treats has made the tacking up the bridling super easy. And I have the option to cross tie, not cross tie, depending on what I'm doing. So my turnaround time between horses in training now ah. got really fast with that method. <laughs> <laughs> time management. <laughs> yeah. And then as I'm untacking, um, I'll go in the tack room to put away the tack and come out with a treat. So they've all learned to stand outside the tack room door, waiting for that treat to come out, even if they're loose and they're not tucked. Yeah, I tried that with Callie. Didn't she work. She walked off. 
Yeah, but she still had her bridle on. <laughs> I, mean, I took the saddle off and I was putting it in the tack room and I can hear her walking off and I go out there and I go, Callie, whoa, and she stops. <laughs> oh, good. That was lucky. <laughs> Only because she felt like it. Yeah, really. <laughs> that would be an interesting podcast going over, you know, all, how many, how much of our language does the horse understand? Horses will learn anything. Yeah. And that I, I, you can teach a horse anything. And it was funny when I lived in Europe, everybody spoke German or Switzerdeutsch to the horses, you know, and everybody had their own language, but the horses learned the meaning by the follow through. Yeah. So whether it was positive or negative and reinforcement, of course, we can teach our horses to sort of speak English because we're repeating a phrase over and over until right. it has meaning. So absolutely. So I think let's wrap it up there. We didn't really talk about tricks, but maybe we can talk about tricks next week. Um, but treats was a big one. Like I was surprised how many people viewed that video I did. Uh, it's under the Horse Hacks, Horse Geeks Hacks playlist okay. on my YouTube channel, which is uh, all lowercase Kirsten Nelson on YouTube. And um, that was crazy how many views I had on treats. I go, I think it's still a big issue. In It'll most be barns. interesting to see what comments we get. <laughs> yes. Yes. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us for another Horse Geeks podcast. If you're on YouTube, please like, share, subscribe. That would be great. And we always welcome all the comments. Thanks so much, you guys. We'll see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Bye.